to continue the island vibe for summertime, we're going to go to Tartarian Tales 19 in the Isle of Kalamplui. This is a little further on in Pinto's journey and another no doubt pristine and magical land of wonder and amazement that he will describe for us. The sequence of events that Pinto and his crew go through during these chapters are nothing like the beauty of this drawing right here by my wife Erin, but very interesting and actually ends up taking a little bit of an, a darker turn and they end up meeting some cool people, getting some interesting old school perspective and describing some more just uh, concepts that are, are timeless really and you know they were around then, you gotta love them. And Pretty amazing. So let's find out about the fabulous Isle of Kalemploi. Having rounded, as I said, this point Guanaitaro, we saw about two leagues ahead of us, and I believe a league is three miles, or around there. Right in the middle of the river, a flat stretch of land, like a floodplain, which appeared to be a little over a league in circumference. As Antonio de Faria came in close to it, he felt a deep surge of excitement, mixed with no small amount of fear, for up until that moment he had not yet realized that he had gotten not only himself, but all the others into a very dangerous situation. It was more than three hours past nightfall when he dropped anchor about a culverin's shot's distance from the island. In a daybreak, all those who were called into conference for the purpose agreed that, since it did not seem likely that anything as magnificent as that, of such obvious splendor and majesty, would be left unguarded, it would probably be wise to sail completely around it first, as silently as possible, in order to see what landing places it had and what obstacles there might be to our disembarking, and that, depending on what was discovered, we would decide what to do. Antonio de Faria ordered this resolution to be carried out, and without making the slightest sound, he moved in close to shore and sailed all the way around it, looking it over at will and taking special note of everything for as far as the eye could see. This island was encircled by a raised embankment 26 handspans tall of jasper stone masonry, the slabs so beautifully cut and set that the entire wall appeared to be made of one piece, a feat of construction that left everyone gasping with amazement because they had never seen anything like it before anywhere in the world, either in, in or outside of India. The base of this wall was set in the very bottom of the river, and from there to the surface of the water it measured another 26 handspans, so that altogether it was 52 handspans high. At the top of the embankment where the wall ended, there was a border running all the way around, also made of jasper, carved in the shape of a twisted rope, like the waist cord of a monk's robe, about as thick as four almud parrel, and on top of this a brass railing fashioned by lathe, with balusters spaced six arms length apart, also made of brass, each of which supported a female idol holding a sphere in her hands, which at that time had no special significance for us. Running along the inside of this railing, there was a row made up of an infinite number of cast iron monsters holding hands like dancers, encircling the entire island, which as I said before measured nearly a league in circumference. Behind these monstrous idols, forming a concentric circle around the floodplain, there was a row of arches so exquisitely wrought that the eyes could never have their fill of admiring them and all the rest within the enclosure consisted of a very dense grove of dwarf orange trees, in the middle of which had been built 360 chapels dedicated to the gods of the year, about whom these pagans have written a great deal of nonsense in their histories to compensate for their inability to see the light. Further up, about a quarter of a league, on a land elevation rising to the east, there appeared some buildings with seven facades, like those of a church, all covered in gold from top to bottom for as far as the eye could see, with very tall spires which appeared to be belfry towers, and on the exterior, running all around these buildings, were two streets covered with arches which matched the seven facades and were all from the top of the towers all the way down to the ground covered with gold, which was why everyone thought this was probably a very sumptuous temple of exceedingly great wealth. After a careful examination of this island or floodplain, which was possible because, as I have said, it was situated in the middle of the river, Antonio de Faria decided, in spite of the late hour, to go ashore and see if he could find somebody in one of the chapels who could give him the information he needed to help him decide whether he should proceed or withdraw. And after posting the necessary guards on both ships, 
he went ashore with a landing party of 40 soldiers and 20 slaves, made up of both lancers and arquebusiers, along with four Chinese who had visited the place several times before and were familiar with the area, to act as guides and interpreters, leaving Father Diogo Lobato behind in command of the two panoras, since he was an intelligent and extremely courageous man. And after touching shore without encountering a single person or detecting any kind of sound or movement up to that moment, he passed quickly through one of the eight entrances to this compound, made his way through the middle of the orange grove, and headed for a chapel coming in view that was located about twice a musket shot's distance from our point of disembarkation, where he found what we shall see in a moment. Whew. And I had only planned to do that chapter, but I cannot leave you all in a cliffhanger like that. I just won't do it, so let's keep going, because the next title begs to be heard about. 76. The Desecration of the Tombs Antonio de Feria made straight for the chapel ahead of him, treading as softly as he could and not without some trepidation, for he still had no idea of what he had gotten himself into. And with each man keeping the name of Jesus on his lips and in his heart, we reached a small courtyard in front of the door without encountering a single person on the way. Antonio de Feria, who had been in the lead all the while with a broad sword in his hands, tried to the door and felt that it was locked from the inside. He ordered one of the Chinese near him to knock, which he did, rapping twice. Blessed be the Creator who painted the beauty of the heavens above, a voice from within replied. Come around to the other side and I will hear what you desire. The Chinese went around the chapel and entered through a side door. Then he opened the other one for Antonio de Faria, who rushed in with all his people and found an old man there who looked like he was more than a hundred years old. He was dressed in a very long robe of purple damask and appeared to be a noble person age. Noble personage, which, as we found out later, he was indeed. But the sight of the soldiers crowding in was too much for him to bear, and he collapsed. He fell face down on the floor and lay there with his feet and hands a tremble, and incapable for the moment of uttering a word. However, once he had gotten over the initial shock, which took quite some time, he regained complete control of himself. Then he looked around at everybody, and through, though his smile was sweet, his words were blunt as he asked us who we were or what we were doing there. Speaking through the interpreter, Antonio de Faria told him that he was the captain of that group of foreigners and a native of the kingdom of Siam, and that while on his way to the port Ningpo, where he was bound on a trading voyage in a heavily laden junk of his, he had been lost at sea, and that it was only by a miracle that he and all those men there with him had been saved, and that because he had vowed to make a pilgrimage to this holy land, to give thanks to God for saving him from the grave peril he had faced, he had been faced with, he had come there now to fulfill his promise and, at the same time, to ask him for a bit of charity, to help him get a new start in life, and that he could assure him that within three years he would repay him double the value of whatever he took from him now. The Hitakau, as the hermit was called, thought about what he had heard for a while before he spoke. I have, I have listened very closely to what thou hast said, he replied, looking straight at Antonio de Feria. Also, I have understood what thy purpose is, and that it is an evil one, clouded by thy blindness, which, like a pilot of hell, is leading thee and the others straight to the lower depths of the lake of the night. For instead of giving thanks to God for the great mercy thou sayest he has shown thee, thou comest to rob him. Now I ask thee, if thou dost such a thing, what canst thou expect of divine justice when the time comes for thee to draw thy last breath? Put aside thy evil purpose. Do not allow the thought of such a dreadful sin to cross thy mind, and God will put aside the punishment awaiting thee. Trust in me, for I am speaking the truth, so help me God as long as I live. Pretending that he approved of his advice, Antonio de Faria begged him not to get upset, for he assured him that, at the moment, he had no more certain way to gain a living than what he had come there to do. At this, the hermit raised his arms and turned his gaze heavenward. Blessed art thou, O Lord, he exclaimed with tears in his eyes, for suffering the presence here on earth of men who will commit offenses against thee to gain a living, rather than serve thee a single day to gain the certainty of eternal glory. He remained somewhat preoccupied by these thoughts and a little distraught over what he was witnessing, but after a moment he looked up at all the noise and commotion we were making by pulling down the coffins and breaking them open. Then he looked at Antonio de Faria, who was standing there at the time, leaning on his broad sword, and asked him to come and sit next to him for a moment, which Antonio de Faria did with the utmost courtesy and signs of respect. 
However, that did not prevent him from motioning to the soldiers to continue with what they were doing, that is, ransacking the coffins and picking out the silver objects that were to be found among the bones of the dead. The hermit was so deeply affected by what was going on that twice he lost consciousness and slid off the bench he was sitting on, as though overcome by the dreadful sin being committed before his eyes, and with a heavy heart he resumed his conversation with Antonio de Feria. I wish to declare unto thee, he said, as one would to a man of sound judgment, which thou seemst to be, how one can obtain pardon for the sin thou hast so many times pointed out to me, in order that thou mayest not perish for ever and ever with thy last breath. Since, as thou hast said, it was sheer necessity that drove thee to commit such a dreadful crime, and that thou hast every intention of restoring what thou hast stolen before death comes to thee, if the opportunity should present itself, then thou must do these three things. First, thou must return everything that thou hast stolen before thou diest, so as to remove from thy path all obstacles to the clemency of the Lord on high. Second, thou must implore him with tears in thy eyes to forgive thee, for what thou hast done is extremely offensive to him, and for that reason thou must mortify thy flesh continuously, night and day. And third, thou must share whatever thou hast with God's poor, distributing thy charity with thine own hands judiciously and discreetly with the same generosity thou wouldst show thyself so that the servant of darkness will not have a case to argue against thee on the day of judgment. And in keeping with this advice I urge thee to instruct thy men to pick up the bones of the saints and not to profane them by leaving them on the ground. Antonio de Faria promised he would and treated him with every mark of courtesy which mollified the hermit somewhat but did not satisfy him completely. Moving still closer to him, he tried to make him feel better by speaking to him soothingly and gently, in loving and courteous terms, protesting that after hearing what the hermit had just told him, he already repented of having undertaken the voyage, but that his men were saying that they would kill him if he were to turn back now, and that he was telling him this in great secrecy. To which the hermit replied, Please, God, let it be so, for then thou, at least, wilt receive a lighter punishment than these other ministers of the night, who behave like a pack of hungry dogs, and whom, it seems to me, all the silver in the world could never satisfy." Wow. Very awesome. I love hearing the impressions of these the older, wise people, and this seems very genuine as like a response that someone like that would have, being helpless, but in a situation where you can't really, uh, you know, you don't know about it. They're desecrating your, your people. You have to do something, but you know you can't physically. So, very interesting. And they never say what religion this person was, if it was just an ancient one or if or whatnot, but the ones with Jesus were uh, persecuting, desecrating the tombs, and this other guy was saying stuff that makes very much sense, kind of like karma. And uh, I firmly believe in that as well. And you got to get right. Judgment is, that's an important thing. You've, a lot of people seem to be forgetting because they turn their back and they go to the other side and then they're like, oh, it doesn't matter. But this place is a miracle. It starts off as, we start off as tiny, insignificant little eggs, microscopic things with consciousness inevitably. And everything you've ever done started from that. It's not going to end at the end. And <laughs> there's more. There's so much more. There has to be miracles abound and we'll continue this journey and i've got many more that i've been finding lately so stay tuned for many more tartarian tales and tell your friends let's get more people talking bless you all